Hey guys, this is Onia. Sorry it's been a while since I've done my previous teaching. Life's been a little bit complicated and stressful and um, my, my grandma died earlier this year in February and then her husband, my grandpa, died about a month ago. So I've just been going through a lot and um, been pretty busy with with my things in my life but I have not forgotten what I'm called to do it's just I'm trying to find I'm trying to find uh, how to go forward because I have a lot of stuff going forward a lot of plans and goals for my life that I want to do but it's hard to know where to start there's so much to do I just don't know where to start but um so I, I was not going to be doing videos for a while, but I wanted to start doing videos again soon. And the other day, earlier this week, I was asked by Jackson Snyder to do a, a video teaching for his group, the, the Yahat, as they refer to it. It's an organization that he has, which which tries to reach out to people and point people to the Essenes and trying to live a more holy life in accords with the way the Messiah originally taught his disciples back in the first century. So in some ways it's kind of like a Hebrew roots type of idea, uh, an organization focused on that. And I am not an official member of their of his organization, but I am a partner with his organization. I've done teachings with him in the past for his group, and so I was more than happy to do another teaching uh, this time as well. And so I have done a special teaching this time on the Book of Jubilees. I've given an overview of the Book of Jubilees now. I was told originally in an email from Jackson Snyder that he wanted me to do a teaching on Jubilees on Sunday, this Sunday, which would be tomorrow. However, I got a Facebook notification and then emails and messages from Jackson saying, asking me to go on to do it today. So I was not expecting that. I often save things for last minute via via procrastination I'm trying to be better about that in certain ways but you know it's not always easy procrastination is sometimes really helpful uh, to put things off to a better time that's more convenient but at any rate so I was not fully prepared for the teaching today um, but I have done Jubilees in the past a lot, and I've, I'm well familiar with the subject, so I was able to use a rough outline of what I had written in the past about Jubilees and my knowledge about Jubilees. Um, using all that helped me to be able to do a good job presenting on the Book of Jubilees, even though I had done pretty much no planning or prep work for it. So anyways, with that said, I'm, I have loaded this teaching that I did for Jackson's group uh, to my YouTube channel. This is the video that it'll be in. This is just right now what I'm doing is just an introduction. So if you want to skip this introduction, you can just go right to the, where the part begins. But, so basically, I want to talk about my, the, my Patreon, because I did make an agreement in, on my Patreon that whenever I make a video, I would mention their names in my video that they're supporting me. So, with that said, I want to give a little bit of info about this Patreon thing. Basically... A lot of people have started to use Patreon because YouTube has 
taken away monetary ability for a lot of YouTube uh, channels. A lot of people used to make tons of money with YouTube and then some of the way YouTube calculates financial stuff for ads changed and a lot of channels they saw their revenue the amount of money they were earning go down radically due to in many instances censorship of some of the YouTube channels due to content that YouTube didn't feel was good for their advertisers to put their ads on that sometimes happens when like the actual companies themselves paying for the ads object to their videos being in certain types of videos so uh, at any rate the policies that YouTube has been presenting has put the has put uh, YouTube channels at a loss for how to supplement the revenue they were making prior to their revenue drops some people can't make that much money on YouTube because they don't have enough followers uh, but there's a way around that and that's websites like patreon it's a really good website which allows people to donate their money to people they believe in and they support their cause so if you want you can support me via patreon I'll give you guys the link here's the link I'm gonna read it out it's patreon.com uh, okay so it's patreon.com slash dead sea scrolls religion so to spell it out for you pay uh, me p a t r e o n dot com slash d e a d s e a s c r o l l s r e l i g i o n that's the that's the link to my patreon page and there you can decide how much you want to donate um there has been one person who has done uh i'll tell i'll tell who the people are one person is donating two dollars a month they've been doing that for a while that person's name is Dean Smith thank you Dean Smith for for donating and someone named Daniel Simpson has recently decided to donate $25 for me uh, for my ministry so that's greatly appreciated now for Daniel Simpson he's donating $25 and according to according to my patreon it says I, I have put it there if you pledge $25 every month I will have a Google Hangouts conference with you twice a month so far I, I have tried to contact him a couple times and he has not replied uh, I tried to contact him to ask if he wants to do that because if he wants to he's he's eligible to do the Google Hangouts with me um, but so so if you guys are interested in doing the patreon you got to follow up with me on some of these things like the, the Google Hangouts conferences we have to we have to communicate I, I try to contact the people who sign up but they don't always reply so please if you're interested in the rewards contact me so we can schedule a time to do this um, you'll see on the patreon website that I have that the basic supporter is basically you'll be listed in every YouTube video I make and you'll also be listed on a page um, on a page like a dedication page on future publications of, of books that I make then there's the, uh, the the next level is that so that's the one dollar level then the ten dollar level is uh, one Google Hangouts per month with you a the $25 level is two Google Hangouts uh, a month the $50 level is four times a month doing Google Hangouts $100 a month is I will visit you for 24 hours once a year 
the $250 a month, I'll visit you for 24 hours twice a year. The $500 level is I'll visit you three times a year. And the $1,000 level is I will visit you four times a year. Uh, the reason those values are so much, like for example, uh, the $1,000 a month, for example, it can be expensive to travel to, to visit people if you live in another country, for example. Uh, so if you live in Australia or something and you want me to visit you, I can't afford to do that unless um, you help pay my way over. So for the for that level of support, if you want me to visit one thousand dollar a month for or for four visits a year, if you want me to visit three times a year, it's five hundred dollars a month. Uh, visit you two times a year, two hundred fifty, and one time a year would be a hundred dollars a month. So, anyways, those are the level of options. I know it's not realistic for people to do those higher options because most people don't have that kind of money. I just listed them there just in case there were people who someday wanted to do that, who had the money to spend and they wanted to bless me for it and they also wanted to get something out of it that was valuable. And for me, something even more valuable than a Google Hangout is an actual in-person meeting and spending time with the person. So that's what I felt like I could offer for my, for my supporters. Now, even if you only can donate one dollar, that would be greatly helpful to me because, you know, obviously one person giving one dollar is not that big a deal, but a bunch of people giving one dollar, that starts to add up. And eventually, that could help me afford things without needing to do a full-time job. Right now, I have a full-time job, and this full-time job is taking away from my ability to uh, devote my time to this Bible project and to religious stuff that's important because I have to get the money to support myself I have to have this full-time job so if people start donating more money even just one dollar eventually it's going to get to a point where wow I don't need to work full-time anymore so that's the eventual goal with this patreon thing and also to use the money to help support uh, help to buy books and resources in the future because I need to buy certain re resources for this project to be successful. There's a lot of books I need to buy still. Some books, basically there are thousands of dollars worth of books that have yet to be bought that I need to buy for this project. It's a long-term project, it's gonna take a long time, but if you stick in there with me, I believe you won't be disappointed and you'll value the work that I have to share with you guys. Anyway, so that's the, that's this uh, Patreon thing. If you're interested, please join. Um, but if not, you know, if you keep watching my YouTube videos, you don't have to donate to uh, to benefit me. You know, it's just a benefit. It's a great benefit to me to see to see people watching my videos. It's meaningful to me. It helps show me that people value what I have to say, and also. Please, if you can, subscribe. Like, if you like my videos but you're not subscribed, please make an, an account with Google and subscribe to my YouTube channel because it helps me feel better seeing that there's more subscribers. And when you reach the 1,000 subscribers, then you can start monetizing your channel. They recently made a change on YouTube, making it that you have to have at least 1,000 subscribers. subscribers to get ads on your own videos. I was having ads on my videos and I was making a small amount of money, but they stopped putting ads on my channel after they changed YouTube's policy to 1,000 subscribers. I'm almost at the 1,000 subscribers, subscribers, but not, not, not there yet. So please, if you can, uh, consider at least subscribing to my YouTube channel if you value my content. And that's all I have to say. God bless you guys, and thank you so much for your support over however long you've been sticking it out with me. There's a lot of cool stuff that I have to share with you guys. I hope to do some new videos soon. Apparently Jackson Snyder wants me to do some more teachings with him. I don't know, maybe he wants me to do it once a week. It might be a bit tough to do it, but perhaps I could try to do it once a week. 
we'll see how that works out. Hope you guys enjoy this video on Jubilees, and if you have any questions or disagreements, you can feel free to post them in the comments of this video, or message me on Facebook, or message me on YouTube. One thing that sticks out with me compared to some other channels, uh, I allow comments. Even comments that disagree with what I say or or condemn things I say, you know, that's free speech. I do want to, I want to be open-minded and let people share their objections with my content. Because sometimes, you know, people may have a good point and show me that I'm wrong on something. So by all means, well, not by all means, but please feel free to uh, leave comments on my videos, even if they're comments that that criticize me. All right, well, for, for all I said, I'll stop ranting now, and, and here's the video of Jubilees. I hope you enjoy it. Oh. All right, guys, we're going to be talking about the Book of Jubilees today. Just going to pull up the... I'm using... If you want to follow along, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be reading actually from the Book of Jubilees, but if you want, you can have uh, a copy of the Book of Jubilees on hand, like in a book or online. The, one of the websites I like to use a lot is... Uh, it's called Summa Scriptura. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. But it has it has a few of the apocryphal books in a translation, and uh, it's very convenient. So I'll, let's see. Is there a way I could post this for everybody? Yeah, you can. You can uh, use your screen share. What about just posting it in the in the? Oh, you can put it in chat. That would be better. Okay, I'll just put it in the put chat. Put a link in chat. Yeah, so I just posted a link in the chat. Summa Scriptura. Uh, dot the book of enoch dot info and then it has the slash with the jubilees link there yeah nice <laughs> he loaded the uh rh charles rh charles uh edition um i'm just gonna pull up i as i said i prepared a a little bit of an outline so that's gonna i'm gonna kind of use that to give a little bit of a an idea of how i want to approach this so for the Ahad, we are for the. Uh, is it showing my uh, screen for you guys? No, but we have we've got the link, so we can just go and get the book and. No, I mean, is it showing? Um, oh, you're it's seeing. Showing, your face. It's showing my face for everybody. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay. Um. So for the Ahad, as we know, you know, one of the big things we've been trying to do is study the Dead Sea Scrolls and gain insight from these ancient scrolls because they represent the earliest, the earliest copies of the Bible. Uh, and we're, what we're trying to do with the Ahad is trying to go back to the, to the original followers of the Messiah and and kind of reconstruct the faith as best we can. Of course, we're not going to all agree on all the minute details, but uh, I think the Ahad has this model of using the ancient documents as a guideline, not necessarily following everything to a T, but we look at the Essenes uh, as described by, the, by Josephus and Philo, and we look at their lifestyle as compared to the Pharisees, and we see what the Messiah said about the Pharisees in the Gospels, and we get this understanding that it's the Essenes that were much closer to the truth than the Pharisees. And this is also supported in the document we know in the Yahad as the Nazarene Acts, where, where Peter and the other apostles give an overview of... Uh, well, not an overview. Well, Peter gives the overview, and the uh, the overview discusses how the apostles, I think it was at the temple area, they were rebuking 
refuting some of the doctrines of the other groups. They mentioned the Pharisees, uh, they mentioned the Sadducees, Samaritans, but nowhere in the Nazarene Acts does it speak against the Essenes. Same thing with the Messiah in the New Testament. There's nothing spoken against of the Essenes. So we have this idea that there seems to be something special about the Essenes, and when you look into the amazing discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it seems too unbelievable of a find to be a mere coincidence. It appears that Elohim gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls miraculously in order to help us point back to the truth, because I'm sure Elohim has seen very clearly that we have completely gone off track as a society in the whole world. There's very few people who are in line with the original way. So I, I believe that in these final times, a lot of these books have been being restored to us bit by bit. And I think we have a special gift here to use these books to help point us all back to the original original followers of how to live our lives. So anyways, that's kind of the overview of uh, why the Book of Jubilees is so interesting because what's very interesting is that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was the only Christian group to preserve the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and a few other apocryphal texts. And what's very unbelievable is that the Dead Sea Scrolls also has the Book of Jubilees and Book of Enoch, and it shows a strong link and connection between the, the Essenes of the past who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, or whoever wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, that, that group. It shows a connection between them and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, because it's not a coincidence that they were somehow able to preserve Jubilees and Enoch. There must have been a direct connection along uh, along the years. So the fact that Jubilees was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls makes it a very important text to study. And what we've seen by comparing the copy of Jubilees in the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Ethiopian Orthodox copy copies, uh, we see that they're very similar. The What that means is that even though there have been some changes over time in the Book of Jubilees, in like the, the by the in the manuscripts that the scribes copied overall it appears that the book of jubilees has been very well preserved by and it was preserved by the ethiopian orthodox church so we owe a lot of debt and gratitude to them for preserving that that document now before i get into discussing some more about the specifics of jubilees I think it's interesting to point out that there are some people who accept both the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Jasher as holy texts that are both scripture. And I used to be in this camp way in the beginning, many years ago, uh, before I really did a in-depth comparison of the two documents. And what I can say is that when you compare them more closely, you'll see that they they are radically contradictory. Like, there's not really a way of reconciling the two documents. That's how horribly contradictory they are. So you kind of have to make a choice between the two documents, Jubilees or Jasher. And on the one hand, Jasher is, you know, there's, there's a reference to the book of Jasher mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in two places. But we don't have any manuscripts of Jasher. We, the only thing we have is late printed copies from the medieval era, from the 1600s. So that's not a very ancient witness or testimony. Even if that Jasher was legit, which I do not believe it's the authentic Jasher, uh, that if it is authentic, then it, I believe it's... Um, was not originally referenced in the Old Testament. There's actually some evidence that the references to Jasher were added after the fact by some scribes. But um, I would say that there's just very weak evidence for the authentic authenticity and 
ancient origin of the Book of Joshua, whereas for Jubilees, we have a lot of evidence for the ancient testimony and authority of the book. And on another point, Joshua has a lot of stories which are kind of far-fetched. They seem more mythological, more silly, um, comparable to some of the Greek mythology. Some of the stories um, uh, are hard to believe. You, you can, you know, it's, it's possible that these things happen, but it doesn't seem to have the same spirit as the Old Testament. When you compare the Book of Jubilees, however, to the Old Testament, overall it has a similar spirit of authenticity. It reads like an Old Testament book. It has a primitive style, at least compared to, to Jasher. Jasher does not have a primitive style, whereas Jubilees has this very archaic and primitive style. So it's something that's actually very um, compelling in favor of Jubilee's authenticity over Book of Jasher. Another thing is, we didn't know this before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, but Jubilees has so many unbelievable connections with the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the biggest connections is a, with a document called the Genesis Apocryphon. And the Genesis Apocryphon actually presents books of the patriarchs as if the patriarchs wrote them, such as there's a book of Lamech, claims to be written by Lamech, the patriarch. There's a book of Noah, claims to be written by Noah. Book of Abraham, claims to be written by Abraham. And unfortunately, the rest of Genesis Apocryphon wasn't preserved. The in the middle of the book of Abraham, it was just, it cut off and the rest of it's not preserved. But when we look at Jubilees, we see that, according to Jubilees, we are told that Noah wrote a book, Abraham wrote a book, Jacob wrote a book, uh, various patriarchs wrote an account of what happened. And when you look closely to what Jubilees is telling us, it becomes clear that Jubilees is claiming not to be secondary to Genesis, but primary. What that means is it's claiming to be older than Genesis. And in many ways, Genesis appears to be a later writing. What, peop what a lot of scholars think about the Book of Jubilees is that Whoever wrote the book of Jubilees used Genesis as one of their sources. I think that's a assumption that should be questioned and challenged. I challenge that strongly. The evidence appears to be the case that Genesis Apocryphon is older than Genesis and that Jubilees uses Genesis Apocryphon as one of its primary sources and does not use Genesis. And my contention is that Genesis actually uses Jubilees as one of its primary sources. So I think Genesis is secondary. And when we look at, there's diff, as a, I'm a scribe, I haven't been able to do it as much recently, but I'm trying to work on the scriptures to purify them and restore them to the original, what the original said. And one of the main things that we see, at least for the law of Moses, is there are three there's a bunch of different traditions, but there's three primary textual traditions that we have found. That's the Masoretic text, which is preserved by the Jews, uh, primarily the Jews. Uh, we see the Greek Septuagint. That was preserved by the, uh, it was preserved by some Drew, Jews early on, but it was tr translated from Hebrew into Greek. And then because Jews were not as big on Greek, Eventually, they came to despise Greek entirely, whereas the Christians received from the Essenes, they received a copy of some of these, uh, some of the scriptures and some of the extra other books in Greek translations, because most of the Christians or most of the early followers of Messiah didn't speak Hebrew, so they needed a translation that they could understand. And, and Greek was a language that meant they, almost everyone could understand. So they translated it into Greek, and through the Christians has been the primary preservation of the Septuagint. And then you have the Samaritan Torah. The Samaritans, who are very similar to the Jews, but they are kind of an offshoot, and they only accept the Law of Moses, they have their own copy of the Torah, and it's very unique 
it has some similarities with Masoretic text, but it also has a lot of similarities with the Septuagint. So anyways, those are the three primary versions. You also have Septuagint breaking off into different traditions, like the original Septuagint was translated into Latin, and that's called the Old Latin. The Old Latin has some preservation of the original Septuagint that the Greek manuscripts that we have don't. So there are some important witnesses to the Septuagint uh, in some other languages. Anyways, all I have to say, why am I talking about all this? Because it's very relevant for the Book of Jubilees on a textual criticism basis. Because when we look at Jubilees, for example, uh, I recommend I recommend Vanderkam's translation of translation and edition of the Book of Jubilees. He made a very good modern version. Doesn't have the these and the thous and stuff like that. It also has thorough footnotes. It utilizes the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it has uh, more manuscript evidence because when Jubilees was done by R. H. Charles, there, he only used, I believe, it was four manuscripts for his edition. Since then, a lot more manuscripts of Jubilees in Ethiopian language have been discovered, and. In that, I could also give you guys that PDF file later on, uh, maybe on Facebook. Uh, I have a PDF copy of that book, that uh, that translation of Jubilees that Vanderkam did. If you, the reason I could give it to you is because it's if you want that book like a physical copy, it would actually cost you a lot of money. It, it's kind of like it's around. I'd have to check again, but last time I checked, it was over a hundred dollars for the, for that book. So. Not everyone can afford $100 for a book like that. So, but I do have the PDF file that people can have for free if they want it. And in that book, Vanderkamp gives footnotes of explanation and comparison to some other writings. And one of the things that's very valuable about, about his edition is he gives, he often notes in the footnotes uh, passages of Jubilees that agree with the Septuagint copy of Genesis or agree with the Samaritan copy, for example. He also notes sometimes when it agrees with the old Latin text against any other witnesses. So what we see is that Jubilees presents to us a witness to an older version of Genesis which was more similar to the Septuagint and Samaritan Torah. This same picture we see preserved in the actual copies of Genesis found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see copies of Genesis that have Septuagint readings and Samaritan readings as well mixed up within each other. So it appears to be the case that the original book of Genesis was significantly closer to the Septuagint version and Samaritan version of the Torah. Uh, and Jubilees is a great primary testimony to that fact. So that's one of the most important things to glean from Jubilees, I believe, is evidence about Genesis and the changes that have been made in, in the book of Genesis. Uh, there's also a document called the reworked Pentateuch, that's what scholars call it, and it preserves a version of Genesis that has some extra passages and it. Some of the other books of the Torah have extra passages as well. And I've talked in other teachings with the Yahad. It appears that the entire Torah has been radically altered in some big ways. And I've discussed some of, some of those changes that I believe happened. And as evidence, I use uh, copies of the Torah and the Dead Sea Scrolls to show some of those changes. And one of the big ones is the Temple Scroll, as we've discussed which basically has major passages of the Torah, not in our copies, but they are in the copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So with all that said, I'm going to dive some into some of the specifics of, of Jubilees. One of the interesting things about Jubilees is it claims to be an actual writing by the angels given to Moses to teach him the law. And you look at the account in our copies of the Bible, it says that Moses went 
on Mount Sinai for 40 days. What did he do for 40 days, though? It says he was then, after the 40 days, he was given the two tablets of stone. But it did not take him 40 days to be given two tablets. Uh, what else happened during that 40 days? Not much has been made clear in our copies. But from according to Jubilees, during that 40 days, Moses was also instructed about a history of the times, a history of the Jubilees. He was instructed by the angels who explained to him what happened throughout history. That's the basic premise of the book of Jubilees. And it does have a support in the New Testament. There are two passages in the New Testament which pr present a claim found nowhere else in other writings. Not even by the rabbis. It's not preserved by the rabbis either. But it's preserved in this book of Jubilees only. And that's this teaching that Paul says in Galatians, and I believe it's Stephen. Stephen, I believe it is, in the book of Acts. Both of them claim that the law was given to Moses by angels. So we don't see that at all in the Torah. We don't see that in the Old Testament. We don't see that in any other writings. But we see that in the book of Jubilees. Jubilees claims to be the law given to Moses, and it's a first-hand account by the angels all throughout. All throughout the book of Jubilees, you're going to find places where the angels speak in the first person. They say, we, we did this. Let me see if I can find uh, one example, maybe, just to kind of give you guys this idea. Um, let's see. I'm just going to find a, a good one here. Um, okay, so for example, remember the Tower of Babel incident when, when it says Elohim came down to see what was going on in the Tower of Babel. Well, according to this account, in Jubilees it says, well, let, let me go to you know, one verse prior. It says, And the Lord our God said unto us, Behold, they are one people, and they begin to do this, and now nothing will be withholden from them. Go to, let us go down and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech, and that they may dis be dispersed into cities and nations. And one, and one purpose will no longer abide with them until the day of judgment. And the Lord descended, and we descended with him to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. So we see that the angels writing this book of Jubilees, at least whoever's claiming, whoever wrote the book of Jubilees, they claim to be angels, and they're saying that they went down with Elohim to see what was going on with the whole Tower of Babel thing. And there's also another statement. I believe it's when Sodom and Gomorrah are being destroyed See if I can find that. Okay, so it says, uh, And on the new moon of the fourth month, we appeared unto Abraham at the oak of Mamre, and we talked with him, and we announced to him that a son would be given to him by Sarah, his wife. And Sarah laughed, for she heard that we had spoken these words with Abraham, and we admonished her. And she became afraid and denied that she had laughed on account of the words. And we told her the name of her son as his name is ordained and written in the heavenly tablets, Isaac. And when we returned to her at a set time, she would have conceived a son. Uh, and it says, verse 7 of chapter 16 of Jubilees, But Lot we saved. It's saying um, how... Elohim executed judgment on, the, on Sodom, but it says, and it says, But Lot we saved, for God remembered Abraham and sent him out from the midst of the overthrow. So all throughout, as I said, all throughout, Jubilees presents this as angels giving us the law. So that's a very compelling connection with the, with the New Testament. Two places that say the angels gave the law and no other writings say that, that doesn't seem to be coincidence. It appears to be a direct connection 
and witness to the authority of Jubilees. New Testament is telling us that Jubilees is authentic when, it, when we see that connection. Another connection with Jubilees and the New Testament, we actually see in, I believe it's also Stephen's speech, but it could be one of Paul's speeches. We see that how old Moses was when, when he killed the Egyptian. Remember in Exodus, he killed an Egyptian for beating one of the Hebrew slaves. So in that account, we see that we're told in the Old Testament that he killed someone, but we're not told how old he was when it happened. We are told that how old he was when he came back to Egypt to free the Israelites. He was 80 years old when he came back. But we don't know how old he was, according to Exodus, or any, any Old Testament book, when he killed that Egyptian. According to Stephen or Paul, whichever it was, in the New Testament, we know how old he was. According to that document, Book of Acts, he uh, was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. No other writings prior to that speak of him being 40 years old. No Old Testament writings. But Jubilees explicitly states how old Moses was. It doesn't say he was 40, but it's very close. It's very close, and it appears that Acts was just uh, rounding. Because sometimes we see in Scripture, in other writings, that they round numbers. So let me find that one. Uh, let's see here. Um, let me see which passage it is. It's in chapter 47. And we're told that he was... 42 years old, 41, 42 years old, right around there, when he killed the Egyptian. I believe it's 42. Let me just double check that. Yep. Okay. So it's about 41, 42 years old when he killed the Egyptian, according to Jubilees. So that's very close. Whereas the Pharisees, the rabbis, what do they say in their rabbinic writings, they say he was 18 years old. Look at Jasher, for example. Jasher says he was 18, <clears throat> excuse me, he was 18 years old. That's completely off. 18 is nowhere close to 40. So on the one hand, if, if the rabbis are right, then clearly the New Testament is wrong, because that's way off. But if the New Testament is right, Jubilees has to be something to consider, because it's the only other document that agrees. It's a testimony there. So those are two of the many links, strong links, with the Book of Jubilees. We also see one of a, a really cool link with Jubilees in, in the Gospel of John. Um, I'm going to, let's see here. I think I'll, I'll read that for you guys, because it is a pretty cool comparison. So this account is very interesting because this happens during the Feast of Tabernacles when the Messiah is going up to the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, he makes a statement that's very similar to Jubilees and I'll, I'll illustrate that. So here's what it says. And... Gospel John chapter 8, it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So now let's look at Jubilees, where it speaks of something very similar. Um... Okay, so it's, it's in chapter 16. Chapter 16 gives an account of the origin of the Feast of Tabernacles, and, and it speaks of Abraham celebrating a festival of joy for seven days. 
and it says right here, verse, starting with verse 25, he celebrated this feast, this is Abraham, he celebrated this feast during seven days, rejoicing with all his heart and with all his soul, he and all those who were in his house, and there was no stranger with him, nor any that was uncircumcised. And he blessed his creator who had created him in his generation, for he had created him according to his good pleasure, for he knew and perceived that from him would arise the plant of righteousness for the eternal generations, and from him a holy seed, so that it should become like him who had made all things. And he blessed and rejoiced, and he called the name of this festival, the festival of the Lord, a joy acceptable to the Most High God. And then in verse 29, it again says, that they should, they should celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles seven days with joy. And verse 31, it says, Abraham praised and gave thanks to his God for all things in joy. So it emphasizes joy a lot, the joy of Abraham, rejoicing. And it specifically mentions the Messiah in verse 26 that I read earlier, where it says that he saw that a plant of righteousness would arise and a holy seed that would become like him who had made all things. So there would, he saw that there would be a, one of his seed would be, his future descendants would become like the creator. So Messiah is very similar to that. Uh, Messiah, uh, Yeshua, the son of Mary, he is a holy seed from, from Abraham. And, uh, he he became like the creator he's he's like an image of he's the image of the creator so that connection seems to be what messiah is referring to in in gospel of john chapter 8 when he when it spoke of he your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw and was glad it speaks of the rejoicing there and what clinches that interpretation i believe is in that same chapter you could see earlier, um, chapter 7. Chapter 8 is directly connected to chapter 7. It's in the same exact time, time zone, timeline. And chapter 7, verse 2 of John says, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So what this means is that during the Feast of Tabernacles, Messiah was saying to the Jews, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw him and was glad. Uh, what that, what that's not, that can't be coincidence because the similar passage in Jubilees is speaking about a future seed that Abraham saw that would be like the creator. And he rejoiced at seeing this. He, he saw a vision of, of the future seed that he would have. He, he rejoiced about this. And that this vision happened specifically during the Feast of Tabernacles for Abraham. So it's like, it's like as if the Messiah is saying, during the Feast of Tabernacles for the Jews, he's saying, you guys are not understanding the, the spirit of Feast of Tabernacles. Let me point you guys back to the origin of Feast of Tabernacles, Abraham. The origin of Feast of Tabernacles, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw him was glad. So that appears to be a very strong connection with, with uh, Jubilees in the New Testament. There's, there's other stuff too, but that's one of the big ones. Um, I, I said that Jubilees corresponds with a lot of other writings. Like it says the patriarchs wrote different writings. One of the writings it says was written was by Enoch. The book of Enoch is, is mentioned in the uh, book of Jubilees some striking uh, similarity. Also striking similarity is the uh, similarity with the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Now these Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs are very powerful writings, but we have direct evidence that they are not the original writings, that they've been summarized and condensed to a very short summary of their original forms. We have fragments of the original long versions of the Testament of Levi and the Testament of Naphtali. And those fragments show us that the, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs in the original form were much more archaic, more primitive in character, much more in line with the style of Jubilees in the Old Testament, 
the testaments that we have, unfortunately, they've been, they've been Christianized in certain parts. But they still represent a powerful evidence and testimony and link to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and I believe that ultimately the original forms of those testaments are authentic writings that we should study as scripture on similar level with Jubilees. Um, but so anyways, there are some amazing connections that cannot be coincidence with those testaments, the 12 patriarchs and Jubilees. There's a lot of similarities and overlap. So it is very compelling to me that the original form of the testaments also served as one of the key sources of Jubilees. So Jubilees was written after the testaments, the original testaments of the patriarchs. We had this testament to the 12 patriarchs in their condensed form for over a thousand years. Another writing, however, we did not have until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found is a document called the Testament of Amram. That's only found in fragmentary copies, but enough has been preserved in that to show striking correspondence with the Book of Jubilees. The account of Amram's life and the and stuff that happened in the in with the Israelites in captivity in Egypt, there's too many similarities to be coincidence. It's clear that Jubilees also used the writing of Amram, Moses' own father. Moses' father was Amram, and apparently Amram wrote a testament. And so we see that. Jubilees uses that testament as well as one of its sources. So Jubilees is actually a, a compilation of all different kind of sources putting it together. For Moses, Moses needed to teach the Israelites what the truth was and what the law was. Moses would have had to read every writing of the patriarchs to be like an expert at what to tell them. That would have taken a long time for Moses to read it all. The angels wanted to save Moses the trouble and give, basically give Moses a history lesson a, a lesson, a condensed version of the overall narrative of history and the origin of the law. So Moses, instead of having to go through every book, there was a summary that the angels gave him of all the books. Basically, here, Moses, here's what happened, the basic message of these books, of the history of the patriarchs, and we'll tell you right now. And so the angels told the important legal details it focuses on legal aspects. Um, so origin of laws, origin of commandments, origin of historical traditions that the Israelites have. And covenants, origin of covenants. That's a big, big emphasis that Book of Jubilees has on covenants and the festivals. Jubilees focuses on the holy times, the festivals like, <clears throat> like uh, the Tabernacles, Day of Atonement, the Unleavened Bread, focuses on all those and gives us a, an overview of the origin of all these festivals. So that's one of the cool things of Jubilees as well. <clears throat> Sorry my voice is uh, cracking a little bit. I haven't done the, these uh, teachings in a while, so forgive me if I have to clean my throat every now and then. Um, also, a very interesting thing is Jubilees goes by the name of Jubilees. And why does it go by that? Well, of course, that was not its original name. That's a condensed version of the name. The, ori the original name that we're told is that basically it's a division. The book was basically called The Division of the Days of the Law. <clears throat> and it's, it's, in the, it's in the prologue. Uh, the history of the division of the days of the law and of the testimony of the events of the years of their weeks of their jubilees so it's basically the book of divisions of the jubilees and it got shortened to jubilees that's where the origin of the name comes from and so anyways why is it called jubilees because uniquely all throughout the book of jubilees it gives it uses the jubilee period as a time chronology the jubilee according to jubilees was 49 years a 49 year period. Some people believe that it's a 50 year period. There's not that much evidence to support the 50 year interpretation though. And the main evidence that people use to support that is that they say the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. But we see all throughout the Torah that there's a principle of seven. Seven, 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 seven. A cycle of seven. So it makes sense for the Jubilee to be 49 years and not 50 because 49 is divisible by seven. 50 is not, 
it makes sense for the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, to be the first year of the new year or the new Jubilee. So the 50th year is actually the first year of the next Jubilee. That's what Jubilees claims. That's the best way to understand the Torah with preserving the seven principle intact. And not only that, the Temple Scroll also supports that idea because the Temple Scroll preserves, you know how the Torah talks of a the uh, Feast of Shavuot. That's, that's uh, seven weeks. And then on the 50th day is the Feast of Shavuot. Well, according to the Temple Scroll, we have 49 days, and then the 50th day is the Feast of First Fruits of Wheat, and that 50th day is the first day of another 49-day period, 49 day period. And then the 50th day after that 49 period is the Feast of the First Fruits of, I believe it's oil or wine. I can't remember which. I think maybe it's wine, actually. Anyways, wine, I think, comes next. And that Feast of First Fruits of, of Wine, that's the 50th day of the second 49-day cycle. And that 50th day is counted in Temple Scroll as the first day of the third and final 49-day count. A after that final third 49-day count, it's then the 50th day, which is the uh, Feast of the First Fruits of Oil. So the Temple Scroll has 49 days, 49 days, 49 days, three in a row. And each of those three 49-day periods has a 50th day, the day after, but counted as part of the next Jubilee cycle. Or not Jubilee, the next 49, the 49-day cycle. So that's a parallel with Jubilees, because Jubilees has that same, that same uh, uh, 49 count divisible by 7. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, Norman Gray just uh, posted a comment in the group chat agreeing with me. Yeah, basically a lot of people try to use the Jubilees to figure out where we are in history, but they use the 50 year to count it rather than 49. So it throws everything off. Um, the, the, what's interesting about the Jubilee count is that we have some other documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Genesis Apocryphon, for example, that use the Jubilee count. There's not really any books in the Old Testament that we have that uses that Jubilees count, but there are some other writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls that do. So Jubilees is a, a evidence, along with the Dead Sea Scrolls, of a time where the ancient Israelites used the Jubilees as a key time marker. They use it as a key time marker. Just like we use in modern times, we use centuries. We, you know, this is the 21st century. For them, they didn't count centuries, they counted jubilees. It's the same principle, but just a different amount of time to count. So that's one of the powerful things of jubilees. Another thing is the chronology. What we see is uh, for example, the, when you look at the genealogies of the book of Genesis, how old was each patriarch when they had a son? How old was Adam when he had a son? How old was Seth when he had a son? Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, uh, Jared, Enoch, uh, Methuselah, Lam then it's Lamech and Noah. How old were they each when they had a son? Um, they did, the manuscripts of Genesis differ. The, and what happens when you have differing years for how old they were when they had a son, it changes the timeline. So, uh, for example, Septuagint has Adam having a son when he's 230 years old, not 130, like the other manuscripts have. So take the Septuagint, which typically adds 100 years always. To the to the years compared to uh, compared to the other copies, it always is a hundred years more. So watch. L let's just round it to two hundred because I don't want to take all these small figures, but just to kind of give you guys an idea. So Adam had a son at two hundred. Seth had a son at two hundred. 
Um, so that means Seth had a son when he's 400, after 400 years, I mean, 400 years from, from the first day. Uh, so Adam was 200 years old when he had Seth. Seth was 200 years old when he had uh, Enosh. So that means Adam was 400 years old when Enosh was born. But the other manuscripts, we're just going to round to 100 just to kind of simplify it. Adam was 100 years old when he had Seth, and Seth was 100 years old when he had Enosh. Now Adam's only 200 years old when Enosh was born. So Septuagint, by adding an extra 100 for each person, makes the time gap much larger. So now Adam's 400 years old in Septuagint, whereas the one that's have 100, Adam's only 200 years old. So you see over time, the, the difference in years is huge. So what happens is we have three manuscript traditions and they all differ, but basically, according to the Septuagint, the flood happened 2,252 years after Adam uh, was born. 2,252 years. Masoretic text, which is preserved by the Jews, 1,656 years after Adam was born. Samaritan, 1,308 years after Adam was born. Guess what Jubilee says? Jubilees has 1,308, the same as the Samaritans. And Jubilees were not pro-Samaritan. Okay, Samaritans would have been condemned by whoever wrote Jubilees, be it the angels or a later author in the Second Temple period. So, um... So they did, had no motivation to copy the Samaritans. But as the Dead Sea Scrolls prove, because the Dead Sea Scrolls have copies of the Torah that are very similar to the Samaritan Torah, it shows that, okay, the, if the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, if their Torah was similar to the Samaritan, and we know for a fact that the Essenes or whoever wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls would not have agreed with the Samaritans, they would have condemned the Samaritans too. So you have Jubilees, the Dead Sea Scrolls agreeing strongly with the Samaritan Torah, even though they have no motivation polemically to do so. They actually have motivation against the Samaritans. There's more reason to change the Torah to make it different from what the Samaritans say than to change it to agree with the Samaritans. Because we, as we know in the Gospels, there was a strong animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. So, uh, the fact that Jubilees has a lot of similarities with the Samaritan Torah is a strong evidence that for the Samaritan's authenticity, the Samaritan Torah, is, there's something special there with that Samaritan Torah that we should not overlook. I think there's something key there. Hold on. Anyways, uh, yeah, so Samaritan, the... The Samaritan Torah and Jubilees, the key link there. So the fact that Jubilees agree with Samaritan Torah for the genealogy from, from uh, Adam all the way to Noah, that's a strong, compelling evidence in favor of the Samaritan's reckoning of 1,308 years. So you can see with... Uh, you can see with Genesis, how easy time can be changed because they're not using jubilees. They're just using this person was this number of years old. This person was this number of years old. Well, if you do it like that, time gets distorted. But if you do it the way jubilees does, jubilees gives a specific date using the jubilee count for each special event. When it does that, it presents an overall picture. Here's the picture of history. Now, we know for a fact that some parts of Jubilees have been incorrectly altered accidentally by the scribes who did the math wrong, and they wrote the wrong number. They wrote the wrong word. Whoops, we wrote the wrong word. They forgot to change it. But so, for example, imagine you have, imagine you have a, imagine you, you say to someone, okay, guys, I want you to type in a document, type each number from 1 to 100. Type it. So the person on their document types, okay, 1, 
two, three, and they keep typing all the way to 100. Let's say you're grading their paper. You look and they say, okay, I'm counting at one, two, three, okay, all the way to 100. Oh, wait, you skipped a number there, or whoops, you wrote the wrong number there. You, let's, say, let's say they got to 72, and then for 73, they act, accidentally wrote 37 or something like that. Oh, you obviously made a mistake here, but the rest of the count, the rest of the picture, is clear to see, okay, we know the overall picture, but that one example had the wrong, wrong number. Okay, but we have the rest of the picture, so we know the timeline is correct. Just that one little example is wrong. That's what we have in Jubilees. We have overall a consistent picture of, of the dates of everything that happened, because it specifically mentions the Jubilee and the week, uh, the, the seven-year week period, and the, the specific year of each week period. For every event, it plots it out. So in certain passages when the scribe made a mistake and put the wrong number or the wrong word for the number, we see, oh, okay, there's a weird number there, but the, the very next verse has the correct number, preserving, preserving the con continuity of the whole passage. Okay, good. We don't have that for Genesis, though. We, what we have for Genesis is just... They were this number of years old, this number of years old, when this happened. Da, 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 da. So it's so much easier for the way Genesis does it for time to be distorted. The way Jubilees does it, it's much harder to distort the, the, the years when you have that overall framework to work with. So what we're told by Jubilees is that um, – Moses and the, or excuse me, the Israelites entered the promised land in the 50th Jubilee. So you know how there's 49 years to a Jubilee and the 50th year is a year of Jubilee. Well, what's pretty cool is according to Jubilees, there was 49 Jubilees up until the Israelites were freed from Egypt. The Israelites were freed from Egypt in the 50th Jubilee and they entered the promised land in the 50th Jubilee. So that's kind of a cool uh, connection there as well. Then not only do we have that, but we have in, in, uh, we have in the first Kings, we're told that 480 years after, um, 480 years after the Exodus happened, was when Solomon built the first temple. According to Jubilees, the Exodus happened 10 years after the end of the 49th Jubilee. So what's 10 years plus 480 years? That's 490 years. That's 10 Jubilees, exactly. So according to Jubilees, when you connect it with the Old Testament authority, we have 49 Jubilees from creation to right before shortly before the Exodus happens, and then you have from shortly before the Exodus happens to the time Solomon builds the first temple, 10 Jubilees exactly. Then, when you count the time from the first temple that Solomon built all the way to the time, uh, all the way to the time that um, the second temple was begun to be built when Cyrus gave that decree in the first year of the return, when they returned from the exile. For that first year, Cyrus gave that decree to build a temple. During that first year, that there was about 490 years from, from, uh, from the time the first temple was built. The reason I say about is because I believe there, it was exactly 490 years. But the problem is it doesn't use an exact chronology uh, like like Jubilees does, it it does the same thing with with um, with uh, that Genesis does. Like after this number of years, this happened. Uh, first King or you know the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles uses how many years a king ruled, and then the next king came. So you have the king ruled this number of years, and then the king ruled this number of years, and then the king ruled this number of years. Some kings overlapped in their rule, like. The king still ruled while the other king started his rule. So the problem is some of the numbers get thrown off a little bit. But overall, it's very close to 490, and I believe 
it actually was 490. It's just all math is confusing. But when, when you do the math, I do believe you can make it come out to exactly 490 years, starting from Solomon all the way to the first year that the second temple was being built. Now you take the book of Daniel, you go from Daniel, and he tells us, tells us about 70 weeks. What's the 70 weeks? Seven week, a week is seven-year period. So seven-year period times 70, that's 490 years, 10 jubilees again. So it appears that these jubilees are a key to determining where we are in history. The Exodus happened shortly after 49 jubilees after creation. The Solomon built the first temple 10 jubilees after that, the, shortly after the Exodus. And uh, then the first year of the building of the second temple, that was, again, four, 10 jubilees later. And then the Messiah dying and rising again and in bringing forth a new covenant and ending the sacrifices, another 10 jubilees. So 10 jubilees, 10 jubilees, 10 jubilees, 30 jubilees. It appears that the concept of jubilees is key to uh, keeping track of where we are in history. And there's this concept of some of these writings. We One of the things we talk about in the Yahad we talked about before is the Epistle of Barnabas as a authentic writing to study and learn and read from. And one of the teachings in Barnabas is this 7,000 year theory. This idea is that six days of creation, seventh day was the Sabbath. In the same way, there'll be 6,000 years of working against uh, Satan or the evil one working. Because as we know, in some of these writings, we're told that the evil one has control over the world, has dominion over the world right now. Then we're told in Revelation there's a thousand year period where the Messiah rules on earth. And it says in Revelation that Satan is locked up for a thousand years. So you have six days of working or 6,000 years of working against what Satan's doing. And then 1,000 years or one day of rest because Satan is bound, he's trapped. And you don't, we no longer have to work against what Satan's doing anymore. Now we can have peace and love on earth. You know, we can thrive and sing Kumbaya, you know, all that stuff. We, we can be at peace. And there's prophecies that no more war will happen. You know, the nations will put down their sword. That's one of the Jews' premier arguments against Yeshua being Messiah. They say there's still war, so he can't be Messiah because one of the prophecies is that when the Messiah comes, war would end. So that's a big thing. When, if the Messiah comes back, the Jews believe the Messiah is coming back, or not, excuse me, not back. Do the Jews believe the Messiah is coming someday? Muslims believe he's coming back. Christians believe he's coming back. Buddhists believe that there is a future Buddha that's coming. Zoroastrians, they are still Zoroastrians, I believe, today. Uh, they believe that a future Savior is coming as well. All these different religions appear to be agreeing that a Savior is coming. And let's face it, the world we're in today is horrible. Like, I mean, there's some great stuff, but we're on the brink of world war all the time, uh, nuclear stuff, it's going crazy. You know, there's all kinds of scary stuff that's gonna be coming in the future. Um, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, who knows what the technology is gonna be like, and that's gonna be a big, scary thing. Especially because, you know, the government will have all the power. And once the government can do, have all that technology, they can do whatever they want. That's pretty scary. Um, especially if we have corrupt leaders. And we always have corrupt leaders, but for the most part, I think they're sincere, most of the leaders, but uh, all it takes is one insincere cor corrupt leader to have all that power and then start a world war, kill millions, billions of people. Who knows what could happen? So anyways, we're also destroying the world that we have with like, I know not everyone agrees with, you know, the global warming stuff, but we're polluting, we're polluting the world. We're doing a lot of damage to the environment. So we're basically self-destructing. It's only a matter of time until the world kills themselves if nothing happens. 
we can't wait on, on Elohim to save us because we don't know when that's going to happen. Although I do believe using that 7,000 year theory, we can have an idea of when he's coming back. But basically we need to, uh, we need to try to do, to help the world ourselves and not wait on when too many times have people said he's coming back at this year and he never comes back. And then some people sell all their riches and they lose everything because they believed in the person that was telling them he's coming back. That's a distraction. We need to focus on the here and now and trying to help people and help make the world a better place. So uh, while we're still here, we got to try to do all we can to stop the world from killing themselves. Amen. When the, if, if the Messiah comes back or if, if a savior figure comes, he's going to uh, basically save the world and make it a better place. And this teaching of Barnabas appears to fit with this idea of the 7,000 years. Again, divisible by seven. So if, we, if the Jubilees chronology is correct, we can use that Jubilees chronology to uh, backtrack where we are in time and see how long is it until the 6,000th year? Because according to the, that whole theory of Barnabas, that basically it's the 6,000th year when the Messiah institutes that 1,000 year Sabbath period. So when is the 6,000th year? According to different chronologies, it's already come. Septuagint, it's already come. Masoretic text, it depends how you count it. But according to the best count, it's already come or it's coming soon. The, the rabbis, they have a weird thing that they, they backtrack to, and their backtrack conflicts with history in, in certain ways. So they have what's called the missing years. So for the Jews, we're only in the year of 5,773 or something, around there. We're not even in the year of 5,800 yet. That's how far off their chronology is. So anyways, if this theory is true and Jubilees is key to determining when the year of creation was, you, then that means using Jubilees, we're only in, we still have about, basically I've calculated using this, using this idea that the 6,000th year will be in the mid to late 22nd century. That's a long time from now. But according to the math of, of Jubilees and, in connection with the Old Testament and that 30, the 30 year, uh, the 30 Jubilees thing, it just seems too exact to be coincidence. I believe that's a very strong compelling connection to determine where we are in time. Uh, so that, all that to me points, I've done the math from roughly when the year of creation is using Jubilees, Book of Jubilees, all the way to where we are now. And using approximately a 32 AD to 36 AD for the Messiah's year of death, Right around there, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be the exact year, but right around there, or even 30, and some people do 30 AD. Anyways, right around that time, it's only a seven year difference in between that stuff. So uh, take that seven year period from 29 AD to 36 AD, roughly when Messiah died, backtrack to the first year of creation using Jubilees and the, the book of Jubilees and the 30 Jubilee periods that I mentioned. And then count from when the Messiah died, where we are today. That shows us that the 6,000th year is right around 2,170. So if I was to predict when the Messiah would come back, I predict he comes back in the 2,170s. So he's not going to come anytime soon, according to what I've discovered. Okay, it looks like we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, we're gonna to have to wrap this up shortly. Um, or let's see, is, what is that? Are you asking what's the number of when I think he's coming back? The Gregory just uh, posted. Uh, okay, I believe he's coming back uh, 
in the 2170s. So let me just check that. Right around there. Um, I know a lot of people think that the, the world is so bad, we, we, can't, we can't make it there. Uh, but I believe the world is going to go on much longer than we think. Um, let's see. Yeah, so they, they say the Jewish year is 5,778. That means they believe that he's not going to be coming back for another, like, 220 years. So 220 years, that's, that's in the 23rd century. Uh, where, so there, there, it's a similarity of a long way. Um, yeah, and then Gregory asks, so Israel as a nation could continue to grow and exist. Yeah, I believe, I believe more and more, more Jews will come, will go back to live in Israel. And I believe eventually there's going to be a third temple built. You know, there's a strong push for that. Whether or not you agree with the temple being built, there seems to be, it seems to be inevitable that one day they are going to build one. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up in just a second, but there's, a, there's another question. Uh, she says, it looks like every 10 Jubilees something big happens. Um, I would say not necessarily, but we see that, we do see that for three consecutive periods of 490 years. But we can't necessarily make that jump that every 490 years something significant is going to happen. Um, now, anyways, there, there's all sorts of amazing questions that people can ask, but I just want to kind of wrap this up with, with the Jubilees thing. Um, because I, unfortunately, I didn't go, I didn't dive as much into Jubilees as I would have liked to. Um, but I did give you an overview, which, so I hope that is appreciated. We can pick it up again next time. If you, if you feel like you'd like to do more sessions, uh, we'd love to have it. Yeah, I could. Let me just, let me just say like a summary conclusion that's very brief of, of, for more about Jubilees. Uh, basically, there are tons of other things that I did not get into, which are striking similarities with Jubilees and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and as I said, Temple Scroll. So that I've done in the past in some of my teachings, I've read passages from Temple Scroll and Jubilees has the same commandments and they're found nowhere else. Temple Scroll has it, Jubilees has it, no other documents have it. Striking connection with Jubilees and Temple Scroll is the Temple Scroll is authentic, which I've shown evidence for the, in the past that it is, and that it's more authentic than Deuteronomy that, that we have. If there's a connection then, if Temple School is more authentic and there's a connection with Jubilees, that gives some stronger evidence that Jubilees is something very powerful and we need to look into it. So um, I highly recommend Jubilees. I personally think it's, it's more significant and more important book than the book of Genesis. Uh, it gives a lot more details. If you read Genesis, there's a lot of holes. You say, what happened here? Do, 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 do. What, what's going on here? Jubilees fills in a lot of holes that Genesis leaves out. It gives you a more complete picture of the origin of the law. Uh, which, when, when were commandments, when did certain commandments originate? And this is a controversial, uh, this is a controversial uh, doctrine, but look at this sometime. Compare, study and read Jubilees on your own time, and you're going to see that Jubilees gives its own spin on the Noahide law teaching. According to Jubilees, basically, there are Noahide laws that only Gentiles have to keep, that Gentiles only have to keep the Noahide laws and not the entire law of Moses. It presents the law of Moses as a specific covenant given to, the, to Israel as a holy people. It says the Sabbath was only given to Israel. It says certain festivals only for Israel. Um, the, basic, the basic idea is that Israel was made into a holy nation. But a key difference between between uh, the rabbis and Jubilees, the rabbis say there's only seven laws of Noah and Gentiles only have to do those seven laws and then they don't have to do anything else. Jubilees doesn't say that. It just says there is a law of Noah. It gives some of Noah's laws, but it doesn't give all the laws. So it kind of leaves it up to you to figure out what are Noah's laws. And that's something we should really discover. Are there, is there a law of Noah? In, the Book of Enoch seems to refer to a law of Noah. Jubilees seems to refer to a law of Noah. There's certain writings, like the Book of Gad, also refers to the Law of Noah. So that's something that could be key for the the Yahad in the future. 
looking into, is the no hide law concept authentic? And if it is, what's in a seen version? Because we don't want the rabbinic no hide laws, though that doesn't make sense. But is there an a seen version of no hide law? And if there is, let's look into it because maybe if we discover what the no hide laws truly are, uh, that can lead to the Yahad movement doing better in reaching out to people. That's just something to think about. Anyways, that's all I have to say for Jubilees at this time. If we want to do some more studies in the future, I'd be more than happy to. Yehuah bless you all, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. And if you have any questions, um, you can, you can uh, talk to me on Facebook or email. And I do want to say one thing, one more final thing. Um, if you want, you can edit this out, but I hope you don't. Basically, uh, I have a, a YouTube channel, which uh, I teach variously on the ZC schools, and I have some of my teachings that I've done for Jackson Snyder and the Yahad in the past. They're loaded there for you to hear. Um, there's a lot of great information there. I haven't been able to do as many teachings recently, but I'd like to do, start doing some more in the future. And uh, I also have a Patreon. I have a Patreon, which if you're interested in supporting my work, you can consider uh, supporting me. Uh, even with $1, a $1 thing is, would be helpful, uh, but it's nothing you have to do. It's just if you feel led to do it, that'd be awesome. And I will just say, there is an atheist channel who, who does tons of videos, and his Patreon, ha he gets $10,000 a month for his atheism. He teaches atheism. He gets $10,000 from don people who donate their money to atheism. $10,000 every month. I'm not saying you have to give me money, but consider consider giving someone, whether it be the Yahad, the, the, the Yahad, uh, giving, donating some of your money to the Yahad, or donating to one of, one of your teachers that you believe is doing a really good work for the kingdom. Because if atheists can get that much people to donate, surely we can do that and do it for a much better cause. It's just a shame that so many people are donating to horrible causes like atheism. So let's try to uh, support each other more and be willing to give some of our money to, uh, to donate it to some of these organizations that we believe in, like the Yahad and and other teachers. If you want, give some to me. If you want, to give some to Jackson or just... Whichever teacher you you like, I believe that would be a good thing for people to do. Great. Anyways, that's that's it for the uh, teaching for today. I thought it was going to be tomorrow, so I wasn't prepared. I'm sorry, uh, but I tried to improv as best as I could. Hopefully, my improv was good enough for you guys to you did great, man. benefit from it. Thank you very much. We'll catch. We'll get on this uh, maybe next week if you're free. This uh, I taught me an awful lot here. Thank you. You're welcome. Shalom, guys. Shalom. Have a great